You are a healthcare professional and you want to know how to inject leg spider veins and blue veins by microsclerotherapy. Injection of telangiectasias, also called spider veins, place the skin under tension to provide a flat surface to facilitate needle puncture. This is accomplished by spreading the fingers and thumb of the non-injecting hand and applying counter-traction with the little finger and hypothena eminence of the injecting hand. Use a 30 gauge needle, half inch, and inject with the bevel of the needle turned upward. Place the needle flat on the skin. The injection should be performed slowly and intravenous injection should be confirmed while the injection is in progress. Only inject when you are watching the needle tip. Successful intravenous injection results in blanching along the course of the thread vein. Blanch no more than two centimeters by two centimeters area of telangiectasias at a time. That's because the solution is most active close to the injection site. And this is worth repeating. The needle tip should be observed at all times. The injection must be stopped immediately if a bleb appears, which indicates extravasation, or if there's blanching of the skin, in contrast to blanching of the vessels, which indicates veno-arteriolar reflex venospasm, or injection directly into a small arteriole. In addition, injection must be stopped immediately if the patient experiences pain. Injection of small volumes of low concentration under low pressure minimizes the risk of post-sclerotherapy telangiectic matting. Let's turn to the injection of reticular veins and blue veins. Reticular veins lie just deep to the skin at the injunction of the dermis. So when you're injecting blue veins, the needle is not flat on the skin. Instead, it is angled by five to 10 degrees. Blue reticular veins in association with the telangiectasias are treated first. The sclerosant is injected slowly up to a maximum of about 0.5 of a mil for any single injection site. Injection must be stopped if resistance is felt, if the tissue around the injection site becomes raised, or if the skin around the vein blanches. And it's a good precaution at intervals to ask your patient to bend his or her ankle up and down to promote the flow of blood through the deeper veins in order to minimize the risk of gastrocnemius vein thrombosis. Now let's look at a series of leg spider vein injections and let me give you my comments as we watch together. So here we see a cluster of telangiectasia on the outer part of this patient's right calf. I'm preparing to inject them. I disinfect the skin with an alcohol-based skin cleanser. Consider allowing a few seconds to allow the alcohol to dry completely to minimize the discomfort of, in, of the injection. The first step is to stretch the skin. As you can see, I'm using the index finger and thumb of my non-dominant hand and the little finger of my injecting hand to stretch the skin in three different directions. In this situation, I'm using a straight 30 gauge needle with the bevel upwards. I place the needle flat on the skin and slowly advance it while watching the tip. As I advance the needle I apply a little pressure on the piston of the syringe. You can see a few drops of sclerosant leaving the needle tip even before the skin is punctured. Successful injection of sclerosant into a vessel is indicated by blanching of the vessels. The leg veins appear to disappear. Of course, what is happening is that the blood within the vessel is being displaced by the clear liquid sclerosant. It's certainly a very dramatic appearance, but the spider veins have not disappeared. Injection of the sclerosant is just the beginning of the healing process. Notice that I'm injecting small amounts of sclerosant slowly under low pressure. Before I withdraw the needle, I hold the piston of the syringe still for a few seconds. This allows more contact time between the sclerosant and the endothelium before the sclerosant is deactivated by the return of blood into the vessels. Some experts suggest 
that this improves endothelial destruction. Now, of course, not all injections are successful, and here you can see a small bleb. A bleb represents extravasation of the sclerosant outside the vessel, and it indicates that the injection must be stopped immediately. Notice that when I cause a bleb, I move on to another injection site as soon as it appears. Here I'm checking that the needle is positioned such that the bevel is uppermost. Once again I apply a little pressure on the piston of the syringe as I advance the needle. A few drops of sclerosant solution leave the needle before the skin is actually punctured. And don't worry, sclerosant dripping onto the skin doesn't cause any problems. Keratinized squamous epithelium is not damaged by sclerosant. Now, as the needle is advanced, the vessel is successfully cannulated and you can see blanching once again. I inject small volumes of sclerosant under low pressure. Before removing the needle, I hold the needle and the piston still for a few seconds to allow additional contact time between the sclerosant and the endothelium. And that's because as soon as the needle is withdrawn, the spider vein will fill with blood and the commonly used sclerosants in the United Kingdom, such as sodium tetradecyl sulfate, STS, and polydocanol, are deactivated on contact with blood. Now, although the appearance is very dramatic, I avoid the temptation to cause blanching over a large area. It's much better to inject several small sites with small volumes of sclerosant. Now, as the needle is advanced, the vessel is successfully cannulated and you can see blanching once again. I inject small volumes of sclerosant under low pressure. Before removing the needle, I hold the needle and the piston still for a few seconds to allow additional contact time between the sclerosant and the endothelium. As soon as the needle is withdrawn, the spider vein will fill with blood and the commonly used sclerosants in the United Kingdom, such as sodium tetradecyl sulfate, STS, and polydocanol, are deactivated on contact with blood. As I advance the needle, I apply a little pressure on the piston of the syringe. You can see a few drops of sclerosant leaving the needle tip even before the skin is punctured. Successful injection of sclerosant into a vessel is indicated by blanching of the vessels. Now, as the needle is advanced, the vessel is successfully cannulated and you can see blanching once again. I inject small volumes of sclerosant under low pressure. Before removing the needle, I hold the needle and the piston still for a few seconds to allow additional contact time between the sclerosant and the endothelium.
Now, from time to time, even the most experienced and expert practitioner will inject outside the vessel. A bleb indicates that the injection must be stopped immediately. Other warning signs to stop include pain on injection and blanching of the skin. This is not to be confused with blanching of the vessel. Blanching of the skin uh, indicates that uh, a small arteriole or an arteriovenous shunt has been injected. And if you continue injecting in this situation, you'll get very uh, severe skin loss. Now, transillumination devices are also useful in some situations. They allow the easy visualization of the deeper feeder veins, as well as providing traction to the skin. Uh, here I'm using the non-dominant hand, illuminating the area with a vein light. I've got a, a disposable sheath over it to minimize the risks of contamination with blood. I aspirate before injecting into the reticular veins. Reticular veins in association with telangiectasias uh, should be treated. Most experts would agree that these feeder veins need to be injected as well. Now, successful microsclerotherapy is only the beginning of the treatment process. Initially, the treated areas will look a lot worse, and it's important to reassure your patient that this appearance is normal after successful microsclerotherapy. It doesn't indicate that anything's gone wrong. Uh, it can be quite dramatic, and patients could be horrified by what their legs look like immediately after injection if you don't warn them. Now, in my clinic, I use a topical potent steroid cream on the injected areas. Perhaps an antihistamine cream would be just as useful. I only apply it once, and I only apply it immediately after the injection session. So in summary, a successful injection of leg spider veins depends on stretching the skin, the use of a fine needle, most experts would use a 30 gauge needle, with the bevel uppermost. Spider veins and telangiectasias are very superficial and the needle should be placed flat on the skin. Some prefer to bend the needle 10 to 15 degrees and slide the needle flat along the surface of the skin to cannulate these very superficial veins. Always inject small volumes of sclerosant under low pressure and inject slowly. Watch the needle at all times whilst your injection is in progress. The principles of injecting reticular veins are similar, but reticular veins are larger and they lie deeper. So for these reasons, it's helpful to puncture the skin with the needle at a slight angle to the skin, about 5 to 10 degrees, rather than having the needle flat on the skin. I recommend that you, you aspirate reticular veins before you inject in them. And as before with spider veins, watch the needle tip while injecting and consider the use of transillumination.